Thank you so much, Pastor Robert, and thank you all for coming out to this. You know, just like Pastor Robert said, it was such a vivid thing for me to think that it was two years ago at this very conference that I was there just before everything started going a little bit crazy. And so it makes it all the more sweet that we can come together and gather together for this. And we get to talk about such a marvelous theme. We get to talk about prophecy about the return of Jesus Christ, about us being ready for that return. So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna get into a time where we talk about discerning the signs of the times. That's a big subject, isn't it? I, I, I'll do the best I can with it in the time we have together allotted for that here this afternoon. So Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, Lord, uh, for, thank you for your son that you so graciously gave and redeemed us by his great sacrifice. Thank you for the new life that you give us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the adoption that we have as sons and daughters. But Lord, we we thank you in a special way today because we're together. Here we are together, Lord, in this great big room, enjoying uh, worship together, enjoying the the fellowship, the community of your people, and Lord, ready to hear and receive from you. So help us here now, this afternoon. Speak to us in and through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It was more than 200 years ago. The year was 1816, and a man in upstate New York sat down to study the Bible. He was interested to figure out when Jesus would return. And he gave it two years of diligent study. And around the year 1818, William Miller decided, based on his understanding of the scriptures and biblical interpretation, he decided that Jesus Christ would return in glory to the earth sometime between 1843 and 1844. Now, by all accounts, William Miller was an honest, forthright, godly man. And Miller was not a lone crackpot, but actually he was one voice among many, including several respected Bible scholars and teachers. As that day approached in the United States, as it got up to 1843, 1844, a religious frenzy shook Miller and his followers because they were so sincerely convinced that Jesus Christ was coming. Farms and houses were sold. Wills were drawn up. People gathered together on hilltops to get a better view of Jesus coming in the clouds. But William Miller was obviously wrong. Jesus Christ did not return in glory in 1844, and history bears the bitter record of his terrible disappointment. One historian said this, both Miller and his followers lived to reap the reward of their foolhardy quest and to suffer crushing humiliation, ridicule, and abject despair. Now friends, that's just one story among many through the history of the church. And that's just the kind of thing that makes a lot of people say, we shouldn't be concerned with the return of Jesus Christ. We shouldn't think about the return of Jesus Christ. We shouldn't anticipate the return of Jesus Christ. We should just forget about all that stuff and, I I don't know, put our mind on other things. Well, Friends, I'm here to tell you that despite the folly of some date setters, and maybe we even call some fanatics throughout church history, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ wants us to live in an active anticipation of his return. I believe that we should not be setting dates, we should not be doing foolhardy things like William Miller, but we should, as I said before, live in that active anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ. And let me give you one big reason why. Are you ready for this? Are you taking notes? Because Jesus told us to live that way. When Jesus Christ came in his first coming, he told us to watch and be ready for his second coming. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. 
Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Watch. That means to live in an active anticipation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Therefore, also, therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Be ready. Watch. Be ready. Again, those words speak of active anticipation. And if that wasn't clear enough, in the same Olivet Discourse, Jesus says one more time, Matthew chapter 25, verse 13, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now say it again, just as plain and simple as I can. Jesus once, he said this to us in his first coming. The first coming when he came as a humble servant to die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. He did it in his first coming when he came to triumph over sin and death, not only at the cross, but in his glorious resurrection. In that same first coming, Jesus told us, be ready for my second coming. And I believe this with all my heart that God's intention is that every generation of believers throughout history should live in anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ. This is something that he wants for us. Now, having understood that, I believe that we have more reason than ever to believe that the coming of Jesus is near, that it's even at the door and that we should be ready. No, we're not setting dates. No, we're not telling people to sell their possessions or gather on hilltops, but we're saying, believer, you have reason to live in active anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some reasons, but first, I wanna talk to you about some things that are not the signs of Jesus' return. Hold on with me here. In Matthew chapter 24, it's part of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus described general world conditions in the time between his ascension to heaven and his glorious return. In verses three and four of Matthew chapter 24. Let's take a look at those. Actually, I'm gonna read verses four through eight. Take a look here, Matthew 24. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now please notice Jesus opened up that section in verse four by telling us, take heed that no one deceives you. I think that many people throughout history have been deceived about the coming of Jesus Christ but let's not miss one of the chief ways that people are deceived They're deceived into thinking they should be unconcerned with the return of Jesus Christ. So we don't want to be deceived. But then he says there in verse six, see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Friends, I just want to point out that Jesus says, and it's also very clear in the parallel passage in Luke, that these are not the things that mark specific signs of the ends. Jesus says, after I ascend and before I return glory, you're gonna see false messiahs, as he says in verse five. You're gonna see wars, as he says in verse six. You're gonna see, as he says in verse seven, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Those things have marked history from the time of Jesus' ascension to the present day. What Jesus is telling us is there is no specific famine or earthquake or war or pestilence that marks the sign of his coming. These things will come and go. And there's always been a temptation for humanity in the midst of that kind of crisis to immediately think this must be the end. I'm doing this just from memory. So if I don't have the details accurate, please give me a little bit of grace. But but it, it was just within the last few months that a tsunami 
in the Pacific completely covered over some of the islands in the nation of Tonga. Unbelievable devastation. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a tsunami washing over an entire island? What, what unbelievable devastation. Now, could you blame people who were in that calamity or very close to it for thinking this must be the end of the age? I, I mean, you wouldn't blame them for thinking that. It sure seemed like it to them. But what Jesus is saying, no, there is no specific natural disaster or war or pestilence or famine that marks the end. Those are not the signs of the end. Now, I say that with a very important, at least it's important to me, caveat. Here's the caveat. How Jesus described those things right there in verse 8 as being the beginning of sorrows. Now many of you are aware of the fact that the literal phrasing there in the original language is these are the beginning of birth pains. And there's something that we know about birth pains. I only know it secondhand, but I know it from my wife's experience is that closer to the time of delivery, the birth pangs become more intense and closer together. So while there is no specific war or famine or pestilence that says this is the sign of the end, we should not be surprised to see them concentrated and more frequent as the end of the age approaches. Do you see the distinction I'm trying to make there? Now, in the very same Olivet Discourse, Jesus does point to a specific sign. You see, Jesus explained to his followers after verses four through eight what they should expect in that period between the ascension and his glorious return. He says you should expect to be persecuted, opposed, and hated. You should expect to see the world filled with false prophets and a fading love. And he said you should be busy about the work of preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. And thank the Lord. That is the church's interest today and throughout history. But then, after that, Jesus comes in verses 9 through 14 to something really fascinating. Well, let me just read these verses, 9 through 14. It's a summary of what I just explained to you. He says, and they will deliver you up to tribulations and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. Now, in verse 15, Jesus points to a very specific sign. You know, I'm fighting the temptation of just doing a deep dive, which is not my intention here this afternoon, doing a deep dive on this particular subject in the Olivet Discourse. Because I believe that what Jesus speaks about in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 24 is the interpretive key to understanding the Olivet Discourse. If you get verse 15 wrong, you'll get the whole thing wrong. If you get verse 15 right, I don't know if you get the whole thing right, but you're well on your way to getting it right. Look at verse 15. Jesus points out a specific sign. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, I don't know what your Bible is like, I don't know if you have one of those red letter Bibles. I find it interesting. In some red letter Bibles, the words, let he, whoever reads, let him understand, that's in black. Is it in black in yours? Now, you know what's interesting about that? We don't know. Why didn't Jesus say that? He's referring back to Daniel. Why didn't Jesus say, hey, whoever's reading Daniel the prophet, let him understand. 
I, I don't per, put it out of the realm of possibility at all that Jesus is emphasizing this. Jesus Christ linked his return to a specific sign, the setting up of an idolatrous image in the Jewish temple first spoken of by Daniel. Now what's amazing about this prophetic sign is that Paul also referred to it in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, and it's also mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. Let me tell you something, any prophetic sign mentioned by Daniel, by Jesus, by Paul, and by John in the book of Revelation, it is a big sign. Now I wanna be clear, I do not believe that the church in this present age, the church as it exists on the earth right now, I do not believe that the church will be here on this earth to see the abomination of desolation. I believe for reasons that we're gonna talk about later on the conference. I believe that it's God's plan to catch up or to catch away his people before that begins. And certainly there will be believers on the earth but, but they will not be of what currently constitutes the church, the community of God's people on this earth right now. I believe that the present church will be caught away before this pivotal sign. Now, some people, I think, like to throw a little confusion on this point. Because Jesus told his disciples about the abomination of desolation, which will be set up by the Antichrist in the middle of the Great Tribulation, and because he warned of coming destruction of the Great Tribulation, some Christians believe, based on that, that believers will go through the Great Tribulation. To, to them, it seems evident. Why would Jesus tell this to the church unless the church was going to go through it? Well, listen, the answer to that question is very simple. We know from this passage and from other passages that God will remove his church before the fury of the great tribulation, catching them away to meet Jesus in the air, just as 1 Thessalonians chapter four describes. Yet, this information is valuable for the followers of Jesus, number one, so that they can plan for the future, number two, it will be especially valuable for those who will become his disciples during the great tribulation, after the church as it is presently constituted is gone. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible describes an immense multitude that are saved out of the great tribulation at great cost to their own life and personal safety. W wouldn't it seem natural to you that many of those people will come to faith in Jesus Christ because they read this exact description. So yes, this is meant to teach us, it's meant to instruct us. But friends, the original disciples to whom Jesus spoke these words weren't on earth to see this. Christians over the last 1900 years haven't been on earth to see it. The church as it is presently constituted on the earth now will not be here to see it but there will be people who turn to God during that period, and I have no doubt because they read these words of Jesus and understand it to be that pivotal sign of the end. So, if we aren't around to see this pivotal sign that Jesus pointed to in the Olivet Discourse, do we have any other reason to believe that Jesus is coming soon? Absolutely, positively, yes. And let me go back to the abomination of desolation right now and just say that number one, and I think this is an extremely compelling sign, we see the stage set for the abomination of desolation as it has not been true for almost 1900 years of past history. For centuries, there was only a small Jewish presence in Judea and in Jerusalem. That, that presence in the region was definite, but it was small. They, they didn't have much influence or power. Now, in those years, it was unthinkable that this weak Jewish presence could rebuild a temple at the Temple Mount. Therefore, the abomination of desolation was highly unlikely until Israel was gathered together as a nation in the year 1948. Ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the most astounding things that has happened in all the history of the world. 
a nation that had not been a nation for some 2,000 years coming back together as its own definable nation in the year 1948. That is a radical fulfillment of prophecy and for our purposes here today, it sets the stage for the coming of this pivotal sign that Jesus pointed towards. You know, there's a group in Israel today, they call themselves the faithful of the Temple Mount. These are people who are absolutely committed to building a temple on the Temple Mount. This is their purpose in life. Many of you, if you visited Israel, you visited their institute, you've seen their production, you've been up on the Temple Mount, you've seen how it could be built. You know this. Now, I do not want to give anybody the wrong impression. This group in Israel is small. It's seen to be a fringe group. But nevertheless, it's real, it's passionate, and it's committed. I I think that or something very much like it is going to be the seed form of what happens when this temple will be rebuilt. In addition, as Christians look upon this, this promise of a coming temple I'll be straight with you. We look at it with mixed feelings. On the one hand, when we see the focus, the fervor towards rebuilding a temple, we go, woo! Prophecy fulfilled in front of my eyes. Look at the stage being set. We better be ready. And we understand that. But I do say as believers, we have mixed feelings. But what's the mixture in the feelings? Because any place of sacrifice for the purpose of atonement for sin (laughs) that's not in the will or plan of God oh I believe the temple has happened God God will will allow it to happen but it will not be a God honoring thing for anybody to offer an animal sacrifice once Jesus Christ has perfectly fulfilled the sacrificial system by his great sacrifice at Calvary so again we do it with mixed feelings It is thrilling to see prophecy progress right before our eyes. On the other hand, we say, God forbid that that anybody would try to make an atoning sacrifice in this present age that would somehow deny the effectiveness of what Jesus Christ did on the cross perfectly and once for all. So friends, we see the stage set for the abomination desolation. That is the pivotal sign that Jesus pointed to. But that's not the only reason. You see, when you study the scriptures, when you take a look at Daniel, when you take a look at 1 Thessalonians, when you take a look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse, when you take a look at the book of Revelation, when you take a look at scattered other passages throughout the Old and New Testaments, you see that the Bible describes something to us of what the world will be like in the very last days. Does it not? And so the Bible tells us, for example, that there will be a particular political environment in the very last days. Revelation chapter 13, starting in the middle of verse seven. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwelt on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see that? One ruler with authority over the whole earth. Revelation chapter 17, picking it up at verse 13. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. Now friends, the Bible tells us that there will be a world dominating ruler in the very last days. Is anybody going to look me in the eye and tell me that the stage is not set for that kind of thing to happen? That if you just compare now to 10 years prior, you say the stage is even more set. We see that the tools of domination and control supplied by high tech, social media, financial controls, they are ready for the use of this world dominating ruler and his government. You know, I, I've been thinking about the return of Jesus for some time. I think many of you have as well. 
And I remember preaching on this 20, 30 years ago and saying, oh my heavens, look at how the stage is set. And, and just when you thought that the stage couldn't get any more setter, <laughs> it's more setter now than it ever was before. Don't you see that the Bible describes a certain political environment in the very last days and the stage is set for that environment. As well, we see that there is a spiritual environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. 2 Timothy chapter, two, verse, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. It's hard to describe our present age with a better phrase in two words than perilous times. Or take this from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes forth and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Friends, there will be a great falling away. And we live in days of great apostasy and denial of the truth. It's shocking to see it among those who claim to be Christians. This is a time of a great falling away. We notice that in one sense, this is nothing new. But I have to say, that modern tools of technology, modern social media, they speed and spread the strength of this deception like never before. No, the Bible describes a spiritual environment in the very last days, and the stage is set for that. We also see that there is a cultural environment that the Bible describes in the very last days. For example, I am interested in this phrase uh, from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. Look at this. It says, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, I, I thought that the phrase perilous times described our age pretty well. How about this? Humanity taking pleasure in unrighteousness. Look, I mean, I could go on and on about that. We, we, we could have, a, we could have a, a whole conference just on how our culture, just on how the world today not only practices unrighteousness, but it's always been true, but we are uh, going to greater depths, greater lows than ever in our way of taking pleasure in unrighteousness. So much of what we see in our modern age, especially with the obsession with sexual and gender identity, it's a radical manifestation of those who take pleasure in unrighteousness. And again, I wanna say, there's a sense in which there's nothing new to this, but it's hard to escape the feeling that there's a new energy and a new fervor on the part of those who would take pleasure in unrighteousness in the present age. Here's something else that the Bible tells us about the culture of the very last days. It tells us that people will be obsessed with the pleasures of life. Look at this from Matthew chapter 24, verses 37, 38, and 39. Jesus speaking here, he says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know that the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. I believe that this describes the conditions of the world before the great catching away of the church. And how does it describe here by Jesus? eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage, just obsessed, focused upon entertainments and the pleasures of life. And look, friends, let's admit it, let's be honest. We live in an entertainment, distraction, pleasure-obsessed culture. 
And don't we as believers have to be very careful for ourselves and our own souls in this present age? Look, we'd be lying if we say that this doesn't bleed over onto us and affect us. How we long to have some kind of constant stimulation through what we have right here on these devices. That that we can't take a, a calm moment to just think, to just pray, to just seek the Lord. Now look, this is obsession in our present age. It's the kind of situation, it's the kind of scene that Jesus said would be on the earth in the very last days. And then let me give a final point here. Um, Again, I I spoke about this uh, politically and spiritually and culturally. Let's just make one more point, that the stage is set for the kind of economic conditions that the Bible describes in the very last days. You know, you know that the Bible tells us that in the very last days, it will be a time of a very centralized, highly controlled economy. I'll just read you this one verse, Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Friends, Jesus tells us in his word, here speaking through prophecy given to the apostle John, that in the very last days, we will have this kind of radically centralized government, so much so that if someone does not have the mark of the beast, the number of his name, that thing that indicates some kind of worship, some kind of of, of giving of the life over, some kind of honoring of the Antichrist and his system, if someone does not have that, they will be prohibited from participation in the economy. Look, we've been preaching this for years, haven't we? And have not the events of the last couple years made us come back to this all over again and go, whoa. They can exclude people from the financial system like that. The stage is set, ladies and gentlemen. And may I get just real theoretical with you for a moment? I want to consider the possibility that it's theoretically true, theoretically, have I emphasized that word enough? (laughs) Theoretically, that Jesus Christ has not returned for another 200 or 300 years. But I'll tell you what, if he did, then God would have to allow the recreation of these same kind of world conditions that we see right here, right now and so we would be foolish to not notice that the stage is set the stage is set in a way that it hasn't been set in the last 2,000 years for the literal fulfillment of the abomination of desolation a literal image that is commanded to be worshiped that is set up in a Jewish temple rebuilt in Jerusalem friends the stage is set for the fulfillment of that we see that the Bible describes a very certain kind of political environment, a cultural environment, a spiritual environment, an economic environment, and the stage is set for the fulfillment of all those things. Now, not everything is in place. I'll fully admit that. You know, the Bible talks about, in the book of Revelation, referring also connected to the book of Daniel, about a special place that a confederation of 10 nations has. Now I remember years ago when we were first talking about it, it was really convenient when the European community, the EU, had 10 nations. It was like, yes, that's it. (laughs) And friends, it may still be it. I'm not saying it's not. But what exactly is the 10 nations and how does it all fit in? I don't know. I'm not troubled by it because if the events of the last years and decades has shown us anything, that things in the world can change so radically, so quickly, that the few 
things, the few pieces of the puzzle that aren't exactly there, it'll be the easiest thing for them to very quickly go into place when the time is right. I'm not troubled by those few missing pieces out there. I say Jesus Christ is coming again and we need to be ready for it. Now, let me conclude with this. I believe that Jesus has given every generation, I mean every generation since the day of Pentecost, Jesus has given every generation of his followers some reason to believe that he's coming soon. And so when we anticipate the soon return of Jesus Christ, we align ourselves with our brothers and sisters throughout all church history who have lived in the active anticipation of the return. And I am not going to say for a moment that any of those people were wrong. They weren't wrong. They were exactly where God wanted them to be. Watching, ready, waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. Not ignoring it. Not pretending like it's something, oh, we shouldn't talk about. I say, oh, well, that's just something that crazy people talk about. That's just something for the William Millers of the world. No way. I want to repeat this to you. Well, let me set a little context before I do that. Just today, someone sent me an article in a newspaper called the Daily Star. Forgive me if I read it to you off my phone right here. The headline reads this, Radical Christians reckon Ukraine war is sign of Jesus' return and the end of times. It sounds like they must be talking about some real crackpots here, right? <laughs> Let me read you the subtitle. You ready for this? Pastor Greg Laurie from the Harvest Christian Fellowship in California <laughs> claims that the Russian-Ukraine war and the coronavirus have prophetic significance for the return of Jesus. Now, when you go on to read the article, which, I don't know, you don't really need to bother. Can, can I tell you one reason why you don't really need to bother? I mean, look, I'm not telling you not to read it. Read it if you're interested. But, but one interesting thing is, is they refer later on to the passage that Greg Laurie is referring to, and they describe it as Matthew chapter 42. <laughs> Maybe you're dealing with some writers and editors who aren't super familiar with the Bible there. But when you read what Greg Laurie actually said, it's very measured. You know, they're trying to paint him as a William Miller. But when you read what he actually said, well, it's just exactly what we've been talking about right here. The stage is set. We see the birth pangs coming. We say, God bless you, Pastor Greg. You're doing a great job by telling people that they should be ready and we should not accept it if the world tries to throw upon us some lame crackpot label because we're doing exactly what Jesus told us to do. That's, that's why I want to end with this. I've read these to you before, but how can I pass these up? Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. I believe for all the reasons that I spoke to you about today, and you have to admit, that this is just a bare skimming of the surface of discerning the signs of the time, is it not? I almost feel guilty by just starting with such a skimming of the surface. But, but again, we, we see the abomination and desolation stage is set for that. We see the political stage and the spiritual stage and the cultural stage and the economic stage. All those things are set. But friends, I want you to know that even without any of those things, it would be enough for me, and I believe it would be enough for you, that our Lord and Savior who purchased us with great price by his sacrifice at Calvary, is it not enough for us that he told us 
to watch, to be ready, and to be an active anticipation of his return. Let's be about that business here and now. Father, we say, Maranatha. We say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We say, Lord, work in us to prepare us and give us the right kind of readiness for your return. Let our anticipation of your return be like a purifying fire in our midst. Let it be, Lord, the kind of thing that spurs us to evangelism and missions and holy living in this present age. Lord, let it make us sober-minded. And Lord, filled with faith and hope, even in the midst of a world that's going crazy around us. Jesus, we thank you for every promise you've given us of your return. We look up because we believe that you are drawing nigh. So Lord, speak to us in and through this conference. Thank you for your soon return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.